great God. Did you know that? He is mighty. He is powerful. There is nothing he cannot do except cross our will. But I want to worship him in spirit and truth today and know that he can do anything.
nothing, that's nothing too hard for God. That's nothing impossible with God. With God, all things is possible. Doesn't matter how small, how big, my God can do anything. Do you believe it this morning? It's all according to your faith. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise be to God Almighty. Praise be to God. What an awesome God. What a great God. What a mighty God. Oh, God, we need you this morning, God. Praise be to the Lord. Amen. We're going to get ready to go before him this morning in prayer to give him an opportunity. You know, God is just looking and waiting for an opportunity to bless you. But you have to ask him. He said, we have not because we ask not. But I believe that if you begin to ask God for whatever it is you need this morning or whatever you desire, I believe that my God will supply your very need this morning. So as we go before him this morning, we want to always lift up our pastors, brother and sister Rosa. Let's always lift them up before the Lord. Let's pray for their health and strength. Let's pray for their well-being, their safety. Let's pray that God will always keep them renewed and revived so that they can pour into our life the things that we need from God. Let's also pray for our missionaries. Let's remember the brother and sister Tier. Let's remember Michael Washington. Let's pray for them and all, also our global missionaries as well as our North American missionaries. Let's pray for them as well. Let's pray for the nation of Israel. Keep them in your prayers. Pray for Israel. Pray that God will will bless them. Bless the peace will come to Jerusalem. Let's pray for the innocent people that are in, that is uh, also that has nothing to do with what's going on, but they are caught in between. But let's pray for their safety and their protection as well. How many of you need something from the Lord today? Amen. We all need something from God. We all need God to do something for, for us. Let's go before him this morning together. Amen. Let's, let's go before him right now. Let's pray together in Jesus' name. Lord God, we are so thankful. We're so grateful, God, that we can come into your presence this morning. And God, we enter into your gates this morning with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. And God, we're thankful unto you and we bless your name, God, because you are good and your mercy endured forever. God, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to come into your presence, to praise you, to sing songs to you, to lift up your name. We thank you that you woke us up this morning, that you gave us breath of life, and that we have the use of our limbs. We have a roof over our head. We have food upon our table. We thank you, God, for all of your goodness and mercy today. And God, as we come, we come in Jesus' name, asking you to bless our pastors, brother and sister Rosen today. God, we ask you to touch them and keep them and bless them and watch over them and put angels around them. And Oh, God, renew them and revive them. Meet their need. God, we pray for our missionaries. Oh, God, the tears and and Brother Michael Washington, we pray, God, for our global and North American missionaries. God, we ask you to provide their needs. Keep them safe. Watch over them, God. Almighty God, we pray for the nation of Israel. Oh, God, we pray for peace to come to that country. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the innocent people that are, oh, God, that is caught in between. But, oh, God, we know that you, oh, God, that careth. My God, in the name of Jesus, uh, this morning, God, every hand, that was raised in the sanctuary today. God, you know the need. You are a healer of every sickness and every disease. My God, I pray this morning, God, that you begin to touch, that you begin to encourage, that you begin to deliver, that you begin to save. Oh, God, we pray this morning that you will continue to pour out your spirit upon all flesh. Oh, God, we thank you for what you're going to do in this service, and we give you the praise, and we give you the glory. In the name of Jesus. Come on, won't you give him some praise right now? Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. How many are excited about being in the house of the Lord on a Sunday? Praise God. We are so glad that you are here. It's already a beautiful spirit we're feeling this morning. Praise God. I'm excited about what's God is, what God is going to do this morning on our behalf. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. I bring you greetings on behalf of our pastors, brother and sister Olson. Can we represent or give an acknowledgement to all of our guests this morning? Thank you so much for, for being here. We would love an opportunity to meet and fellowship 
uh, with you. You know, I don't just say that because it's part of part of my script. We really do want to spend time and meeting you guys. So if you are able to uh, to hang around just a little bit, we do have a guest uh, reception there in the foyer. Uh, I believe they're still doing snacks and drinks and things. Um, we would like to get an opportunity just to uh, be familiar and just to to to, uh, to greet you. Uh, so if you can hang around for just a few moments, we'd love to to gather with you. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to give greetings to my uh, Hispanic family. Saludo en el nombre de Jesús. That come out all right? They didn't. <laughs> Got to roll that. But that was greetings in Jesus' name. I do have a few announcements. I want to remind us all about our 6 p.m. service uh, tonight. We do have two services on Sunday. Uh, so that's another opportunity to invite folks out to join us here in our 6 p.m. service. Our choir will be singing. You do not want to miss our 6 p.m. service. Amen? Praise the Lord. I want to also make mention to uh, corporate prayer uh, here in this building at 7 p.m. on Tuesday. Um, everyone's in, invited, but we will be having a focus for all the men uh, in the building. Now, men, you, you, you kind of make me nervous sometimes. There are all the men in the house. perfect. I noticed some of you men didn't say anything, so I'm going to try it again. We're all the men in the house. Boy, we some beat down fellas, ain't we? <laughs> but we will be having prayer here at this building at 7 p.m. I encourage all the men out. Again, everyone is invited. I want to also make mention to all the prayer rooms on this side of the building are open 45 minutes before every service because we know that prayer is a big deal around here, right? So I encourage you to join that. Um, and lastly, uh, remembering our Christmas banquet, uh, we are having uh, a special group coming in, the Right Road Quartet. Uh, that will be $50 on December the 1st is the date of the banquet. Um, and there will be a hard stop on that on the 26th, which is next Sunday. Everybody say next Sunday. So you can get, go ahead and get that in through Secure Give. Um, that way you're done with it. Be much appreciated. We always have a great time uh, during our Christmas banquet. Amen. And we will be celebrating in around that time. You might have already seen an email about uh, this. But we are celebrating a birthday. Yeah. Brother Olson's birthday is coming up. Don't we love Brother Olson around here? Yeah. Praise God. So if you've noticed in the vestibule, there is a little basket there. If you'd like to get him a, a card uh, um, or, you know, a token of appreciation, you drop in that basket. We'll be honoring him um, on that Sunday uh, for his birthday. Amen. That's all the announcements that I have uh, this morning. If we can go ahead and have our ushers to make their way as we give this morning's offering. Praise the Lord. Psalms 92 reads, For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O oh, Lord, how great are your works. We serve a good God, don't we? We serve a right on time, God, don't we? So this is that opportunity for all of us to give back a token or a measure to demonstrate uh, some reciprocity of God being good to us. So let's go before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Lord, in the name of Jesus, we, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your place this morning. Lord, you've been so faithful in our lives. Lord, you've restored and you've repaired, Lord, our homes, our families. Lord God, in this morning, Lord God, as we rejoice in your power, we rejoice in your, your might. You've blessed our homes, our families, our jobs, our businesses, our growth, with growth and prosperity. Lord, and we absolutely are marveled at your generosity as it's simply overwhelming to us. Lord, as we bring our tithes and offerings to you this morning, Lord, Lord God, let it be, Lord, a demonstration, Lord God, a representation of all the goodness you've displayed in our life. And we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. And let our giving be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In your precious and holy name we pray, in Jesus' name. If God's been tremendous to you, can we just put our hands together one more time as we give? God bless.
every songless day, and you
crashing to the ground. When the friends I had were nowhere to be found. And I could have seen it then, but I can see it now. There was Jesus. Oh, there was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing.
Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. I want to say that uh, I, I know that uh, I appreciate those that have uh, prayed for us while we were gone the last couple of days. Our My brother-in-law passed away, and uh, uh, this is my middle sister's husband and uh, amen but it was a beautiful home going and uh, it's always a wonderful thing when somebody dies in the Lord amen it really is yes there's grief there's sadness yes and there's the realization of missing them in the physical form but it was a really a wonderful time of celebrating his life and uh, so we are we're so thankful for all of you that prayed for us we got home about 11 o'clock last night so uh, I'm thankful for the Lord and the Holy Ghost today amen and uh, but it's good to be here this morning this is Thanksgiving week and so we ought to pray for all of those that will be traveling and especially those in our church amen uh, Sad to say, but somebody's life probably will be changed this week by an accident because that's the way it is when you get a lot of people on the highway. And so let's pray. Let's pray for our church, and, um, and we will be having a special uh, Night of Thanks service Wednesday. Uh, so you'll want to be here for that. Uh, we're going to go to the Word of God today. We're going to read out of Second uh, Chronicles, the 29th chapter, if you'd like to stand for the reading of the Word of God. It says, Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah and the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. I want to talk to you about this thought this morning. Faithfulness works. I said faithfulness works. Amen. You may be seated. I like to do things that work, don't you? <laughs> I, I don't like, I, too many times the other is in my life when things don't kind of work out. But I like things that work out, and I will tell you that my experience of uh, living for a few years uh, has been that faithfulness works. It works in our lives. And of course, here was King Hezekiah, and, uh, uh, and he came as a 25-year-old young man uh, into being the king over Israel. And uh, so it says here that he did right in the sight of the Lord. Uh, I just want to say that many times people uh, live what is right in their own eyes. That's easy for all of us to do. I've done it, you've done it. We all have. In some degree or another, we do what is right in our own lives. But what works is when we do what is right in the sight of God. It's His commandments and His word and, and following those things. Uh, it's sad to say in the world that we live in, uh, even in the religious world, there's a lot of people picking out this and that and this and that and uh, they just pick and choose what they decide will work for their own lives instead of trying to follow the pattern uh, uh, that God has set up for us you know God loves us so much that he has given us a lot of words to know and understand and read and study uh, so that we would know what was right in his eyes God, the creator of humanity, you know, he made us, he designed us, he knows how we work, and so it is, he sat down and gave us an owner's manual, that's what he did, you buy a new car, they got this little book in there, 
At least they used to. I don't know if they, I haven't bought a new one in a while. They're, they're losing stuff in, in, in cars nowadays. Amen. It, it may be on the screen somewhere where you punch a button and read it. But God gave us an owner's manual. This is how things work. And if you want what works, then that's what you follow. If you want to give yourself all the responsibility, then you figure it out. But if you really want to know what works, then you are faithful to the Word of God and what is written in the Word of God. God. And then it says here in the very last thing, which is a neat neat statement. It says, according to all that his father David had done. And so King David uh, was the measure which everybody else was measured by as the kings. Everybody was measured by King David. And the, the Bible lets us know that he was a man after God's own heart. Uh, you know, David's life was not mistake-free uh, because he had to repent, and he did, but he pursued God and was faithful to God all the days of his life. Faithfulness uh, is not always perfection. Faithfulness uh, is learning to deal with what has happened to you uh, and continuing forward in whatever uh, manner you need to follow after God. And so King Hezekiah was faithful to God. And you know, Israel was in a horrible spiritual state when he took over. And so the Bible tells us uh, that he started by uh, having the doors to the house of God repaired, and then he sanctified the priests and the Levites, and he cleaned out the temple and sanctified it, and, and, and he started sacrificing again, uh, which was, was for the sins of, of Israel, and he started up worship again, and he reinstated the, the uh, celebration of the Passover. He broke down all the altars of the false gods. He started bringing tithe and offerings back into the house of God. In other words, he started up all of the things that God had told them that they needed to have in their lives. Somewhere along the line, Israel had forgotten that it was the laws of God and the commandments of God that were the very most important. And so they had left the things of God in disarray. And so Hezekiah, in his love for God and his desire to be faithful to God, reinstated all of those things that, that I've mentioned here. And it says in 2 Chronicles 31 and 21, And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandments, to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. And I love this last line, so he prospered. You want to prosper? If you really want to prosper, you know, we think when we use the word uh, prosper, we think of financial things or houses and lands and all that, and that's not really what it's all about. It's part of it, but it's not all of it. The Bible talks about our soul prospering. I'm telling you what is more important uh, than anything else in this life is that our soul prospers. And so he sought the things of God with all of his heart. Uh, he obeyed all the laws and all the commandments of God. You know, there are so many times that people don't like laws or commandments and they think that that's something that is to be avoided because they want to do what they want to do with their life. But I'm telling you that God put these places, things in as guardrails, as fences to keep us from the destruction that is outside of all of that. You want to know why our world is in the shape that it's in? Because they've got outside the fence. They've got outside the guardrails. They found themselves in a deep canyon somewhere. And so it is that Hezekiah decided that he was going to 
obey these things. And, and so he did what was right in the sight of God. I will tell you, God's prosperity is connected to obedience and faithfulness. See, God's prosperity goes beyond your giftedness to do things you are not able to do. There's a lot of people that think they're prosperous in life because they are very gifted people. And they're maybe more gifted than others. And so people look up to them and say, wow, you know, they can do all of this. But I will tell you that in all of us, our lives, uh, there are things that are beyond our giftedness. And when God is able uh, to bring prosperity in our life is to every part of our lives. Of course, the Bible tells us then the testing of his faith came. See, that's what faithfulness is all about, your faith. What do you really believe? What do you really think is important? And so that's what faithfulness is all about. It's being full of faith. And so he was tested, and his first uh, test of faithfulness was when King Hezekiah got sick, and the Bible says, unto death. And of course, this is one of the things uh, that your gifts won't help. He was sick unto death. And, and so it says in 2 Kings uh, 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 20 and 3, it says, remember now, O Lord, this is uh, Hezekiah praying, he says, I pray now how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. The Bible tells us that the prophet had come and told him to get his house in order. So you're going to die. And I think there's a few more people that need a prophet in their life. I've seem to run into a lot of individuals that have, don't have their affairs in order. He said, get your affairs in order, you're going to die. And so the king prays to God and, and reminds God of his faithfulness and how he was loyal and he's done good things in his life. And uh, God paid attention to that prayer and sent the prophet back in and God asked, added 15 years to his life. That's real prospering. When God says, okay, I'm going to give you more to life. Second Chronicles 32 and 1 says, after these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah, and he encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. So here comes the second test. Of faithfulness. Okay, he made it through the first thing and facing death. And when Sennacherib had come and he said, I'm going to take these cities, and at first Hezekiah tried to appease the king of Assyria and uh, to pay tribute to him so that they would leave them alone. But I will tell you that appeasing the enemy never works. Because the enemy will always want more. Sometimes when people are in the church and trials and tribulations come, oh, it's just, you know, I'm just going to go out and live in the world and just do whatever I want to because this is just too hard. The reason I'm laughing is because they have no idea how hard it's going to become. I've watched a lot of living. I'm not talking about just in my life, but I've watched a lot of living. I've watched a lot of people make dumb decisions about their life. And if you think it's hard living for God, you don't know what it's like to when you walk away. The enemy always wants more. 
And so the Bible tells us that Sennacherib said, okay, you quit paying tribute, I'm coming for you. So he came to Jerusalem, and, and, but Hezekiah took a, uh, took a stand, and he says, I'm going to believe God for the deliverance. And then in the 22nd verse of the 30, uh, 32nd chapter, it says, of, uh, it says that the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of is, uh, Assyria, and from the hand of all others that guided them on every side. Now, there's a big story there, and I don't have time for that story, but, but a lot went on. You ought to read some of this. I love reading the stories of what happened in Israel because it just shows how God's hand was in their lives all the time. There's a lot of story between there and when I, this first, uh, the first part of this chapter, the end of this chapter, there's a lot of stuff that happened, but I'm telling you, they stood strong, they believed God, they were faithful. When it looked like that all was lost, Hezekiah stood faithful. And because of that, God delivered him from the hand of the king of Assyria. And then the third test of faithfulness that he faced, it says in the 23rd and 25th verses of that 2 Chronicles 32, it says, And many brought gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and presented to the king of Judah so that he was exalted in the sight of all the nations thereafter. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up, therefore wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. Now I'm going to tell you, what I've watched and observed in life is prosperity is the biggest test that you probably face. Because what happens when prosperity comes, all these people bought gifts to the king, to Hezekiah, and, and he had all this, and the Bible says he did not repay. What that means is he did not give honor to God. He didn't say, okay, God, you're the one that's made all this happen. He was saying, man, look at me. Look what I've done. Look what I can get accomplished. And because that he did that, the Lord said, okay, I'm going to bring judgment on this. I know in our society, in all the Christian songs and all of the Many, much of the preaching that is done in churches is all about the love of God. But I'm telling you, God does not love you if he lets you get by with doing wrong. He does not care. If he allows you to just keep rolling on without bringing judgment into your life, he doesn't really care. A parent that does not correct their children doesn't care about those kids. And so, yes, God does love us. And the reason that he does, and the reason that he does bring things into our lives is so that we will be corrected and we'll do something about the wrong direction that we're living in our lives. That's what he does. I'm amazed at people that take the correction of God as just bad luck. I want to say, don't you know what God's trying to do here? Don't you know he's trying to get your attention? Ah, I just, I'm having bad luck, you know. And they dismiss that, and so they never get the benefit of what God's trying to do. 
what he's trying to do in their lives. They don't understand. And so instead of being corrected, they just keep going the way they're going. They just keep doing what they're doing. Which doesn't end up well for them. And so here he was. He, he failed to give God glory for his prosperity. And it tells us that his pride that he showed all of the possessions to the son of the king of Babylon. Hey, come in here, look at mine. Ooh, look at this place. Look how great this is. Look at all these gifts I've got. And God in his love said, okay, you show them all this stuff, the king of Babylon's going to take all this stuff. Sometimes the best thing God can do for us is take all, all the stuff we're uh, proud about. Yeah, we think that it's bad, but really it gave Hezekiah the chance to repent. You know, if you don't know, you're doing wrong. You're not going to repent. And repentance is the love of God giving us an opportunity to make a course correction so that we can start going the right way instead of the wrong way. It says in Second Chronicles 32 and 26, And then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart. And the uh, and of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. So he didn't see the king of Babylon coming in and taking all that he was given because he humbled himself. He repented. He said, "God, I'm sorry." that I, I, I got, got lifted up. Even though he failed God, when he was shown his error, he repented and remained faithful. Like I said about David, his life wasn't a mistake-free life, and neither will yours be. But what do you do when you are faced with that disappointing time to God? How you react it depends on whether you are faithful or not. If you find a place of repentance, you humble yourself before God and see, see the error of your way, then God can count you as faithful. The, in the last part of that chapter, God, it, it, it talks about the things that God had prospered Hezekiah in. It says in the 27th verse, Hezekiah had very great riches and honor. And honor is not something you can buy. And he made himself treasures for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items, storehouses for the harvest of grain, uh, wine and oil stalls for all kind of livestock, folds for the flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much property. Yes. Prosperity in physical things, financial things, does come to those that are faithful. So the degree of your faithfulness, the degree of your giftedness and ability can be tied to that. God rewarded his faithfulness and humility. And then in the 33rd verse it says, So Hezekiah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David. And all uh, Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. 
was faithful through all the tests, even though he failed God. He was faithful to repent. But here it was at the end of his life, you know, being buried uh, with the tombs of da uh, David was of high honor. But it was also a result of his faithfulness. You know, I, I thought about this uh, Friday and Saturday honoring my brother-in-law and the honor of the church and everything that was said so so beautiful but because he lived a life of faithfulness he did in fact when they asked me to say something I I, uh, I thought well Lord what did I say you know there's lots of stuff you can say you know you've known somebody for a long time he married my sister in uh, 1974, so there was a, a lot of things you could say, but the first thing, I, I believe the Lord gave me the thought that he was faithful, and that's what I talked about. Frank was faithful. And so all the honor due him at his death, all the things that were given and said and, and uh, the people that showed up was because of his faithfulness. He was faithful. You know, faithfulness works in our lives. I'm going to tell you, faithfulness won't happen unless your faith is tested. See, your faithfulness has to be tested with the good and the bad times. In the good times, it's to see if your pride gets you, and in the bad times, it's to see if discouragement gets you. Faithfulness is not having a perfect record, but faithfulness is not giving up no matter what happens, is staying that full of faith. That's what faithfulness is, day in, day out, being there, doing what God asks you to do. Do you know that relationship with God is personal? You know that? Do you know that he asks things of you that he may not ask of somebody else? Because it's just you and him. And so we must be faithful to what God asks us of us and what he gives us and, and the stuff that he has written down for us. It says in Deuteronomy 7 and 9, it says, Therefore know that the Lord your God is, he is God and f the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for thousands of uh, generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. I think there's a few people that have raised the last line. But God's faithfulness depends on our faithfulness. That's what it says. It says, if we keep his covenant and his, keep his commandments, and then he will be merciful to us for thousands of generations. So it's not according to how we feel about or we think about. It. It's about what the Lord asks of us. It says in Proverbs 28 and 20, it says, a faithful man will abound with blessings. And that's true. Psalms 31 and 23 says, Oh, love the Lord, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful. Matthew 25 and 21 says, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant, for you are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I think that is the goal, or at least should be the goal of every one of us here, is to enter into the joy of the Lord. Joy can be in your life no matter what's happening if you understand that it's being faithful to God and God is going to be faithful to you. 
You know, when the bad times come in life, and they do for all of us, that's when you're thinking, well, does God really, is he really going to be faithful to me or not? But I, I promise you, in all the living I've watched, when people are faithful during the tough times, through the situations that no one of us, none of us want to go through, that they will have joy in their hearts because the Lord, they realize and believe in the faithfulness of God. You know, King Hezekiah was a man who was faithful to God. He was faithful to the Word of God. I mean, he restored all of the stuff just like the law had said. He restored everything just like God had said. This is the way we do it. And so he did all of those things. He, he proved uh, that he was full of faith because he obeyed the Word of God. And you and I prove whether we're faithful by how we obey the Word of God and the things that are written in the Word. Because he was faithful, prosperity came into his life. More than the financial things of life. His soul was prospering. God will bless your life in whatever you can successfully deal with. Not everybody can deal with things being, having prosperity in their life. Not everybody can deal with that. God not only honored them here on earth, but he was also honored in Faithfulness will work. I have watched faithfulness happen through many lives. And I'm telling you, faithfulness will work. If you will simply follow the pattern of being full of faith, and that faith leads you to obedience, if you do that, God will work in your life. You don't have to have a perfect life. You don't have to have a perfect record. But you do need to humble yourself when it's time to humble yourself. All the promises of faithfulness are open to us if we'll simply just be faithful. I had an interesting conversation with a young man well, he's not so young anymore because I'm not so young anymore, but uh, with a man at the church in uh, Houston and uh, they came into the church uh, and, uh, and I was privileged to pastor him for a, a period of time. Uh, he had went through Mike Wallace is his name and uh, he had gone through quite a few things in his life. He, uh, his first wife passed away suddenly, and that was a traumatic thing. He had a massive heart attack and should have died. And he went through that. And he told me something. He was talking to somebody one day. He said, you know, he said, the Lord has blessed me with two good wives, my first wife and the wife that I'm now married to. He's been married quite a few years now. And he said, you know, they said to me, well, I can't even find one good wife. And you've had two good ones. <laughs> Mike has been faithful. I've watched his life over these many years. He's been faithful. Faithful to God, loyal to 
his pastor always doing whatever he could. And I thought to myself, that's kind of a, what I'm talking about here. Things that your giftedness can't supply. If you be faithful, God will faithfully work in your life. I kind of like the things God provides. All of the things, you know, I was talking, you know, with our, our two youngest ones, and they're doing so good really surprises me that God is moving in their lives in the way that he is and things he's done and and I'm like every other parent you know my kids are the best and but it, I just think about that that blessing in my life was it easy at 50 in my 50s to have two new babies and no wasn't all that easy, but, you know, if you're faithful to God, God will be faithful to you. And I'm thankful to the Lord of his faithfulness. And I'm thankful that somewhere along the line, probably through the teaching of my parents, that I learned about being faithful to God. I wouldn't trade my life. There's been ups and there's been downs, but I wouldn't trade it for anything else than being faithful to God. Let's stand today. I said one time in this church, probably several times now, I told people, do, I said, don't be jealous of what God has given me unless you're jealous of how much giving I've done. Yeah, because it does correlate. When you give God everything in your life and you're generous with God and the people of God, God is going to be faithful to be generous to you. So I guess it's just what kind of life you want to live. What do you want to live? How do you want to live? Because God works things out Unbelievable things he works out. He puts things together that there's no way that I could ever accomplish those things. And that's kind of the neat thing about being faithful to God is he's able to do way more than you're able to do. And so that's what I want in my life. I want God to do what he can do and what he wants to do in my life. But it's going to take me to be faithful. If you'd like to talk to the Lord a little bit about what you've heard here today, amen, you're welcome to come to the altar area if you want to pray where you're at. You're more than happy to do that also. But if you want to talk to God about faithfulness, maybe you need to read. Pledge yourself to being faithful to God. I, I don't know where you're at. I don't know where your faithfulness is at. You know where your faithfulness is at. Why don't you talk to God today? Amen. These altars are open for anyone that would like to come and pray.